T-cell effector function in cytokine biology. Uh, Dr. Looney lives in uh, Rochester, and uh, they're, they've been pretty, pretty hammered for snow and uh, could never make it in this morning. So um, Dr. Rigby and I are going to do our best. Um, so I think you know where this is going. Uh, we've talked about a uh, high altitude view of how the uh, immune system is organized. We talked about recognizing the players in uh, innate immunity. We talked about generating, generating that um, adaptive uh, immune response. And now we're going to get more granular. And uh, again, we come back to this paradigm. Um, uh, within a f first few minutes, uh, you're penetrating uh, integuments. Uh, you have these alarmins uh, there that uh, are generated to uh, protect the host, um, uh, but uh, often, as the case is, uh, they are insufficient. But you still have a few days where we bring in the recruits of our macrophages, uh, those um, uh, fixed uh, killing machines, um, and the ability to uh, turn on um, uh, and recruit uh, the foot soldiers, uh, PMNs, um, uh, uh, to take care of this uh, problem. There's also soluble aspects of this, the uh, immune-based collagens and um, um, uh, complement receptors, et cetera. Um, yet, as in the case of chikungunya, um, that is not enough. And now, now, you need something else. And remember, remember <clears throat> the cell we started out with, the dendritic cell. The sentinel. This is the, 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 the cell that has in the periphery that has has the greatest armamentarium of um, receptors on its surface to bind to these danger signals. It has got the message and it's got to do something with it. And that's what this story is. So just let's let's take it from there. So um, after Aedes aegypti, or Aedes albopictus, the two mosquitoes that carry chikungunya, uh, penetrate the integument, um, we've got our dendritic cell, and in the skin, that's the longer Han cell. Um, it has evaded our local regional defenses, and they, as we said, by and large, the dendritic cell is not killing, <clears throat> but it receives a signal to travel. And where it travels uh, depends upon where it is. Well, in the skin, this will uh, ultimately reach um, uh, a regional lymph node um, uh, via afferent lymphatics. Um, and in the regional lymph node, um, it will engage cells of adaptive immunity, um, uh, activating them through these molecular pathways we've been talking about. And those cells ultimately um, will um, return to the circulation uh, through the efferent uh, blood flow of the lymph node, um, uh, uh, drain into the, uh, or through the uh, efferent uh, um, uh, lymph in through the thoracic duct to the blood, and then be returned to the site of the battle. But when they come there, they are informed. It's a really important concept. And so how, how does this crazy thing happen? Well, here's a kind of a, a, a picture of it in a, in a, in a, in a uh, kind of a slow motion thing. So well, the dendritic cell has uh, received the signal. Uh, it's processed the antigen. It now moves. Um, um, uh, it, it enters the blood and then, um, uh, or enters uh, the lymph node um, uh, via the lymph and resides in the uh, cortex of the lymph node, as you can see here. This structure is called, um, this is a vascular structure, and these um, uh, endothelial cells are called high endothelial uh, uh, venules. And the reason they're called high is because they morphologically um, um, uh, are almost uh, columnar appearing. Um, those uh, specialized endothelial cells bear um, a, a, a signature um, a pattern of adhesion molecules, including L-selectin, that allows naive T cells, naive T cells, um, um, uh, and um, uh, to uh, exit um, and uh, enter the, the pulp of the um, um, lymph node, and this happens every day. Uh, so you have these ten to the tenth. 
um, uh, repertoire of T cells. Um, very few of them uh, have the same receptors for the same antigen. So it's a task. How, if I'm one in a, a billion or, or a hundred billion, how do I find my cognate antigen? Well, they're constantly um, entering lymph nodes in the body from behind your ear to your elbow to um, your groin or um, uh, throughout your organs, and they are scanning, 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 looking for a dendritic cell that might be carrying their cognate antigen. Well, under most circumstances, they don't. If your T cell that is uh, naive, that has binding affinity for chicken gunya, is uh, out there, well, it's not going to find too much until it finds something that looks like chicken gunya. Now, it was not actually teleologically designed to react to chicken gunya, but we have um, a, 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 a spectrum of reactivity that will allow it to be triggered by that. So, where does this occur? Um, this, uh, those uh, T cells will enter the lymph node because they bear a, 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 a passport which gets them uh, into the lymph node known as CCR7. Um, and at uh, this area out in the cortex, they ultimately will find that dendritic cell that has uh, the appropriate antigen on it. Once that occurs, depending upon uh, the signal, um, uh, uh, they will differentiate into an effector cell. Um, this is an example of a dendritic cell in a payer's patch. Uh, so we're obviously in the gut, um, and um, um, uh, the same thing is happening. Naive cells are entering through high endothelial venules, um, can uh, encounter um, uh, uh, an uh, antigen-presenting cell within the gut, and then ultimately will do the same thing and will be deployed back to the gut to be uh, an effector cell. Now, there's a principle here. There's two principles I'd like to make on this slide. So this is showing various subsets of T helper cells um, that have different tasks. First concept, CD8 cells and CD4 cells come out of the thymus as separate and distinct and immutable, pop immutable populations. They never change. CD8 cells don't become CD4 cells. They're, you're, you're committed for life. CD4 cells, on the other hand, are plastic. Well, they'll always bear CD4 on their surface. They can be influenced to become a different cell for a different purpose. I have a worm to deal with. I have a bacterium to deal with. I have chikungunya to deal with. I have um, a, 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 a some other pathogen. All right, so this information has to be translated for that. The second principle involved here is that T cells by themselves, these CD4 cells, they are not directly attacking this pathogen. I mean, not directly. They, they, they are recruiting other cells and other systems uh, to help um, uh, uh, do this battle. And here you can see uh, ranging from activating uh, 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 monocytes and macrophages to uh, um, uh, eosinophils and mast cells uh, to neutrophils uh, to helping B cells make specific antibody. So there is a complex choreography going on here um, uh, that we have to understand. Well, we've understood the first part. We know the antigen has come in. It's been picked up by a sentinel cell. It's come to a regional lymph node. Those T cells are just scanning, 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 um, looking for their cognate antigen um, due to their, uh, uh, their, their molecular passports that they have. They, they, they wind up at the same place and finally exchange uh, the appropriate information um, uh, to activate them. And here we see this uh, cognate interaction between the T cell receptor, the antigen now being uh, expressed on the surface of the dendritic cell, uh, generally a class 2 to a CD4 cell. You can also express class 1 to a CD8 cell, but we're going to focus on this for the moment. And then signal 1, signal 2, activation, proliferation. All right, now we're, 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 we're going to this. But it's much more than that. It's really much more than that. And I use this analogy, um, uh, I was talking to some people last night, that that dendritic cell and that T cell uh, and this analogy I, I got from uh, uh, Richard uh, Ransohoff, who uses it so effectively. He says, it really delivers that antigen 
served up on a silver platter. It is the, it is the interaction that is providing uh, that naive T cell, the information to know what it needs to do and where it has to do it. So there are three things that that uh, uh, um, dendritic cell is telling it. It's saying, one, I found something and it's dangerous. Two, I'm going to tell you what it is and how you, and, and how you can kill it. And three, I'm going to tell you where it's at so you can go get it. And, and, and in a molecular uh, choreography, this is exactly what's happening. This part we've just talked about, signal one, signal two, that just leads to activation and survival signals. Then that, um, uh, in that T-cell um, um, uh, APC interaction, there will be a cytokine milieu, and between the uh, types of cytokines elaborated and the nature of this antigen, all of that confidential information um, to effectively mount this immune response, this, this battle, uh, will be transmitted. So here are some examples. You know, 20 years ago, um, or more, um, we, 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 we knew about CD4 cells, we knew about CD8 cells, the function of CD4 cells was, was uh, rather opaque. <clears throat> and in the 80s, uh, Mossman and colleagues said, you know, under certain circumstances, you can take these T helper cells, and some will make one cytokine, focusing on gamma interferon, another one's going to make a different cytokine, IL-4, gamma interferon. Let's call these cells T helper cells type 1 and type 2. Um, the initial hope for that, uh, at the time, it was quite transparent. They said, well, this is going to be like CD4 and CD8 cells. And we're just going to be able to put a label on them and we can do this. And then far from the truth. It didn't, didn't work out that way. And that under some circumstances, you'd see this TH1 response and some you'd see TH2. They really couldn't, you couldn't, uh, there, there was never a, a cell surface marker that could identify them. And the reasons now are very clear. Remember in the first lecture I gave you, there are innate lymphoid cells that make the same type of cytokines and they don't even have T cell receptors. So um, and the second point that became very clear is that under different circumstances, they could shift, they could morph. They don't have to, they're not immutable. They're not like CD4 and CD8 cells. Now. Each of these uh, T helper cell subsets uh, can come about through a different cytokine milieu. And here I'm just showing a very reductionist view of this. Um, under certain circumstances, and we'll talk about, uh, um, uh, Dr. Rigby will be talking about T regulatory cells, um, a, a cytokine milieu of uh, TGF beta and IL-10 may favor the production of a cell that is designed to promote peripheral tolerance and quiet things down. If you then expose uh, uh, alternatively to the inflammatory cytokine, IL-6, one of the most pleomorphic cytokines that we have um, uh, that is responsible uh, uh, for a large part of the acute phase reaction, um, that can drive the production of another cell subset known as TH17, something that was not envisioned uh, when uh, Mossman and colleagues described TH1 and TH2. And we'll talk about what the function of this is. So just, just presenting um, uh, IL-6 plus TGF beta, and there are many other permutations that can do this. I'm just showing a, kind of an example of this. TH1 cells, on the other hand, are driven by um, uh, a cytokine known as IL-12. This comes from antigen-presenting cells, and this says become a TH1 cell. And we'll talk about what each one of these does. And on the other hand, TH2 cells, um, their signature cytokine, IL-4, uh, as well as uh, other accessory cytokines, can be driven by um, IL-4. So, all right, so that antigen-presenting cell, I've got, the, I've got this dangerous signal. I know what it is. In order to kill this thing, I need a TH2 cell because it's a worm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this information to transform yourself. So let's just look at three of these um, subsets and take it through a, a stepwise progression from a naive T cell 
um, in a regional lymph node um, encountering a different danger signal. On the top, um, I have uh, the generation of a Th1 cell. Um, uh, on the bottom, uh, a Th2 cell. In the middle, a Th17 cell. Well, at, at, at first blush, um, the differentiation pathways is influenced by the cytokine being secreted by the antigen presenting cell. Here, uh, we're generating this um, IL-12 and gamma interferon, driving it in this direction. Here, um, I've got this um, uh, IL-6 signal um, uh, driving it in a Th17 um, uh, direction. And here, I have an IL-4 signal driving it in this direction. Each one of these will induce um, a, a nuclear binding protein that will become a signature and a master switch in driving this forward. And there are actually multiple nuclear binding proteins that are involved, uh, but these are the ones that we uh, talk about for the most part. You might want to recognize their names, uh, GATA3 for TH2, or gamma t for TH17, and TBET for TH1, but it's just a matter of recognition. As these cells then mature, they take on a different phenotypic appearance, they sprout different receptors, and they have the ability to um, uh, effect, uh, 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 um, develop their effector function. So what does that mean? Well, the Th1 cell, the Th1 cell up here has received a, a signal from the, accessor, from the um, uh, APC in the periphery and said, I've got this dangerous situation back here. And here's, here, here's, my, here's my packet of information. And that naive T cell opens it up and it says, there's a mycobacteria in, 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 the, in the hand of my host. Or uh, there's a virus that someone calls chikungunya um, you know, on the back of the, of the neck. And that, that is vital information because that, that tells the T cell, what uh, uh, in 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 a in a in a complex choreography, you know what the threat is, and generates a response on how to kill it. So for the mycobacteria, um, um, uh, that excess, that APC will generate gamma interferon and IL-12, and it'll allow this Th1 cell now to develop. And what does it do? It secretes tons of gamma interferon and IL-2, T cell growth factor and gamma interferon that will activate macrophages, those killing uh, machines that we have that now can process and destroy intracellular pathogens. Beautiful. On the other hand, um, this um, um, uh, 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 dendritic cell has picked up a hookworm. And this not only um, has to identify it as something different, because you need different defenses. You need eosinophils, you need mast cells, you need basophils. So this needs to generate a Th2 response. Um, and its signature inner, inner, uh, uh, cytokines, IL-4 and IL-5, will be involved in the activation and deployment of eosinophils and basophils and kill this. On the other hand, um, TH17 is a driver of neutrophilic infiltration, also has a role in maintaining mucosal immunity. And this has received a different signal. And this will protect us against extracellular uh, bacteria and fungi. And I'll show you some cases from the, immu the immunologist tool bag, toolbox of uh, what happens when this goes wrong. So this is the, this is the, 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 the point of this choreography. Not only that, Remember, the third thing it's, it's going to tell that uh, uh, naive T cell, it's going to differentiate, is where it's at. It's got to get back to the bowel. It's got to get to the back of the neck. It's got to get to some place, or it needs to be dis deployed systemically. So here we have that Th1 um, uh, cell activating macrophages and um, uh, killing intracellular bacteria. Uh, that Th1 response. Um, is involved in a lot of diseases, everything from contact dermatitis to when you put a PPD uh, response on. This is exactly your skewing cells in that direction. I'll show you some other examples. This is just to, to, to recognize there's another part of the immune system we don't talk about much during this course, which is um, uh, CTLs. Um, it's long been known that you actually need uh, T helper cells for 
CTL, effective CTL response. Um, it's part of the, the, the diabolical immunopathogenesis of HIV disease that, you know, in the absence of, of uh, robust CD4 help, um, there is a defective uh, CD8 uh, response um, that uh, allows us not to um, overcome that infection. Um, another signature of the TH1 response is its capacity to create the granuloma. As I told you, that TH1 cell, that's not doing anything directly to these mycobacteria, but it's uh, activating uh, these macrophages. It's doing, uh, releasing cytokines that are giving a huge shout out um, uh, to bring in more lymphocytes um, and these epithelial cells uh, to wall off of, uh, this pathogen. Um, and hopefully um, uh, keep it there for the rest of your life. People that have had latent tuberculosis, um, you know, this, this, they're, they're mycobacteria hanging out there all the time. Um, and this is just a different way of looking at it. So let's take a, a disease. I, I would say um, all of you have talked to so many people here, neurologists and oncologists and uh, dermatologists and rheumatologists. Each of us, we have a toolbox. And we need to be able to open that toolbox whenever we are confronted with new data on pathogenesis, particularly importantly, when we are given new drugs in our armamentarium, anti-IL-17, uh, anti-PD-1, um, uh, JAK inhibitors, uh, this, that, and the other thing. Um, uh, amazingly complex array of, of uh, immunotherapeutic tools. And the question that we should have is that we always have uh, data given to us, because these drugs are approved, on what they do for the disease. And you can go look at the pivotal trials and you can see that it treats arthritis, treats small cell cancer, treats uh, psoriasis, or multiple sclerosis. But the question is, what are the downsides for the integrated immune response? Well. The problem with all of these trials is that uh, safety signals often come out very delayed. Um, TNF inhibitors were approved in 1998, took till 2001 to know that they are associated with reactivation of TB, took till 2006 to know that it could lead to um, class um, mediated reactivation of hepatitis B. Um, natalizumab, which was dramatically effective for multiple sclerosis. Uh, there was never a whiff of toxicity in this extraordinarily well-tolerated drug until two years later when the 24-month data were cut and three cases of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy were seen. So what is that toolbox I'm talking about? There's two things in it. One, it's learning lessons from um, models of immunodeficiency whether they be in humans, where um, knocking out um, molecules in the TNF pathway, uh, either uh, through genetic manipulation or uh, preclinical modeling, um, uh, or primary immune deficiency states um, that might target pathways that we are looking at. And, and let's look at the toxicities uh, uh, associated with that. So we have preclinical modeling, we have immunodeficiencies. So here's a, 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 an incredible, interesting uh, array of diseases that we co now call Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. It's really a heterogeneous group of disorders ranging uh, from uh, sex-linked, autosomal recessive to autosomal dominant that involve numerous pathways involved in the protection um, to intracellular protection against intracellular pathogens. So people who have some defect in this family of diseases um, get uh, mostly, mostly non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, M. avium, M. chelonii, and uh, cansasii. Um, also, we'll get things like salmonellosis where disseminated salmonella or listeriosis live in these uh, diseases, in these uh, um, um, uh, uh, protected environments within cells. Well, if you look at the genetics of this and what's been identified, it all makes so much sense. So here we have defects in things like gamma interferon, uh, uh, the signal transducer, STAT1, I'll talk about this in a little bit later. 
um, and then defects in the NF kappa B pathway. Um, if you look at it uh, from this um, um, a very nice uh, cartoon, here you have a, 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 a dendritic cell, our sentinel. Here you have a mycobacteria that's binding to it. Here you have the, the responding T cell. And then these are all the critical ways. And one through um, uh, uh, six or seven here are different molecular defects that make people susceptible to uh, mycobacteria. So let me just point out wh where the defects are. Uh, number one, defects in the IL-12, IL-23, which we haven't talked about, um, secretion. Remember I said IL-12 is a driver of Th1 cells that make granulomas. Number two, uh, the, the receptor for IL-12. Number three, gamma interferon and gamma interferon receptors. These are vitally important uh, because they're the ones that activate the macrophages. And then finally, um, once these um, uh, cytokines are bound, um, there's a, a choreography of uh, uh, um, signal transducers that ultimately um, move to the nucleus and, and, and lead to uh, susceptible um, uh, uh, successful overcoming uh, of this illness. So this was a case report of uh, a small child, Clarissa, who was um, developed normally until two years of age and developed constitutional symptoms, lymphadenopathy, um, and uh, a biopsy of which showed massive proliferation of histiocytes and neutrophils. Um, no granulomas, no giant cells, yet the tissues were teeming with atypical mycobacteria. It's not the way that this goes. You know, the messenger came back, said, I've got a mycobacteria. You need to get there and you need to kill it by making granulomas, walling this thing off, and then slowly doing it. Something happened here. And this could be perceived by understanding um, the, the toolbox at this point in time. Within a few years, um, this um, child died of uh, sepsis and salmonellosis. Um, another example of a disease in the immunology toolbox that is new. This is only a couple years old. This is uh, from a, a, a remarkable uh, uh, multi-continent study led by Steve Holland uh, from NIH um, of a new form of immunodeficiency, brand new form. And, you know, you think HIV, 30, three years ago, uh, what could be new in this? Well, this is a epidemic of, it is not an epidemic, I shouldn't use that word. It is a widespread recognition uh, of a syndrome where people develop non-tuberculous uh, mycobacterial infections, uh, very similar to the Mendelian susceptibility. They get salmonellosis, listeriosis, and non-tuberculous mycobacteria yet they don't have any of these genetic defects. And what do they have? These people are making antibodies to cytokines. It's kind of like what we do for a living, right? Uh, ever hear of, you know, Utanercept and that's kind of, you know, Tocilizumab. Um, and here is uh, data from looking at uh, uh, five different groups in that study. These are people that had non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, two groups of them. This is a people with just plain old TB. This is a people with pulmonary TB. And this is healthy controls. And this is looking at antibodies to gamma interferon. These people are actually neutralizing their interferon. So what would that be doing? It's taking out this Th1 response. They can't make granulomas. So we're learning a lesson. So, you know, if I was going to be a drug company making gamma interferon antibodies to treat this, that, or the other thing, this is data that you have to respect. So let's look at Th2 for a second. Th2 have got a different, they got a different message. There's a parasite or a helminth or, or an, an allergen in place. Um, um, they can recruit cells of eosinophilic mast cell and basophils uh, to help do this damage. Asthma, we all understand asthma, but it's a complex disease. And there's allergists here that can talk much more about this than I can. Uh, but we do know that uh, upon immediate exposure, we have mast cell degranulation and, you, and people will wheeze. But uh, everyone here knows that asthma is not just a disease of immediate sensitization. There's a delayed reaction. Um, uh, Dr. Looney has this great slide, which I've stolen from him. 
um, which is that you go to the, I have, I have a bad cat allergy, bad cat allergy. And I go to the, you go to the house when you're in the, cat, in the, in the house uh, where the cats are, and I immediately my eyes are watering, my nose is running, my chest gets a little tight, and I get out of the house. But then later no, that night, I'm paying a price because there's a delayed reaction uh, that come with recruitment of cells from the circulation, these eosinophils um, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, basophils um, uh, that uh, um, are doing their damage. If you have chronic exposure, then um, uh, this is a, a different mechanism uh, in and of itself. So here is a drug, uh, dupilumab, and uh, this is a data from a, a study only about a year or so old. This is an a anti-cytokine to IL-4, and this has been very effective in patients who have asthma and eosinophilia. Why? Because IL-4 is an activator of eosinophils. Uh, those cells also make IL-5, which are chemoattractants uh, for eosinophils, and um, people on dupilumab have profound um, uh, 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 suppression of asthma exacerbation, so a nice molecular uh, example of this. Now, finally, let's turn to Th17 cells. These are the most recent darlings of, uh, of uh, the immunology world. They were, were, were held to hold the, the, the answer to so many things because, you know, Th1, Th2 targeting has not been that highly effective in rheumatoid arthritis, but the joints are infiltrated with Th17 cells. But unfortunately, neutralizing Th17 has not been that effective. So it's more complicated than we thought. So as in, in deference to Th1 and Th2, Th17 cells do two things. One, they can recruit polymorphonuclear leukocytes. And two, because they have a pivotal cytokine known as IL-22, IL they can m help maintain mucosal integrity. All right, so in the HIV world, Th17 cells are good guys. We want them in the bowel. And when patients with HIV wipe out their T cells in their bowel, they lose these Th17 cells, and it is believed uh, to promote um, permeability and uh, transmucosal location of organisms. In autoimmunity diseases, uh, diseases like psoriasis in particular, um, and certain forms of arthritis, Th17 cells are bad um, because they can aberrantly recruit um, um, uh, um, inflammatory cells. So what are the, what are the lessons in the immunology toolbox. This is a great study. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about molecules that uh, many of us would not recognize their name. Um, th uh, this uh, caspase activation domain known as CARD9. Uh, this forms a genetic syndrome that's autosomal receptive, uh, recessive that in people that have uh, a deficiency of this um, uh, innate immune um, uh, uh, system uh, mediator um, of uh, predominantly IL-1 pathway activation, they develop fungal infections. And the reason uh, for this is uh, quite interesting, is because if you are defective in CARD9, this, this uh, um, uh, uh, signal transduction protein, um, you will not create Th17 cells, and that is the defect. So here's candida. I told you early this morning, I showed you a picture of a, of a, of a macrophage covered with Dectin-1 and Dectin-2. Those highly bind candida. Through this intracellular cascade that involves CARD9, it leads to the production of cytokines that say, T-cell, I found something. It's a yeast, and it's growing under the armpit. I need you to go there. I need you to generate a Th17 response, and I need you to kill this. Well, if there's a defect somewhere along the line here, that is not going to happen. And in patients with CARD9 deficiency, they're highly susceptible to um, um, uh, candida. It's very interesting, and uh, have some uh, august uh, dermatologists here, that uh, yeast infections have not yet been uh, a big problem with the IL-17 drugs. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, um, but, you know, surprises always happen. So. Uh, uh, there, one of the great immunologists of our generation is Hans Ox, uh, who's done a lot in immunodeficiency diseases. And I, I've told this story before. 
Um, he was talking about primary immunodeficiency diseases, and I was talking about immune deficiency diseases from drugs, from give, we giving drugs and making immune deficiency diseases. And at the end of, the, of my talk, he got up and he said, he goes, you rheumatologist, he goes, you are the sorcerer's apprentice. <laughs> and he said, we give you the drug and we leave, and then you give it and like, you know, all the, all the, the dancing brooms are, are coming out of the closet. It may take a long time, but uh, sooner or later something happens. Hyper IgE syndrome. These people generate um, uh, tremendous numbers of, of, uh, uh, of uh, IgE molecules and eosinophilia. Uh, they're also susceptible to staph infections just for sake of, of uh, time. Uh, this is a patient with a very bullous pulmonary disease. So how, how can that, how can, we, how, can we, how can we parse that in our understanding? Well, people with hyper uh, IgE syndrome, which can maybe autosomal dominant or autosomal receptive, uh, recessive, here's a, a, a flow cytometry showing normally under optimization of activation of Th17 cells, here are all these cells uh, expressing uh, are, that are Th17 cells. Patients with IgE uh, syndrome, hyper IgE, they don't make these cells. And how can that occur? Well, they have many different defects. One is in the signal uh, transduction protein uh, uh, STAT3. Uh, STAT3, remember to make a Th17 cell, I told you you need a cytokine, IL-6. IL-6 is the driver of STAT3. You have a, a defect here, you don't make it. And then there's some other more sophisticated defects on down the line. So IL-17, we now have a approved drug for psoriasis. There'll soon be two more drugs um, uh, for psoriasis. There seems to be some preliminary data that it may be effective in reactive arthritis and, and spondylitis, but there was great hope in rheumatoid, and uh, most of these programs are, have been halted because they are not working. Uh, last comment here that there is crosstalk between all these populations. And I may be a Th1 today, but I may be a Th2 tomorrow. I may be a Th17 cell today, but I may be a T regulatory cell. And they uh, can uh, positive or negatively modulate each other. That is known as plasticity um, and a very hip uh, concept. Um, just moving along, uh, I want to make a couple more comments. This is a patient with atopic dermatitis with a, a staph infection, which is so common. And one of the theories, that there are two leading theories for this um, that have contributed to this. One, people that have Th2 responses, um, uh, so common in, in, in atopic dermatitis, will suppress their Th1 response. And then the more inviting um, uh, 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 mechanism is that people with um, staph aureus uh, with, with atopic dermatitis also have defects in the secretion of defensins, where psoriatics don't. And this is where we actually learned about defensins in studying psoriatic skin. So infections are very common in atopic dermatitis, eczema herpeticum, um, but relatively uncommon in psoriasis, which you think would be a breach of immunity. Finally, leprosy is an example of polarization. Uh, the Th1 response makes these rich granulomas um, uh, that uh, 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 are uh, tuberculous leprosy, um, but leporomatous leprosy, uh, where the organisms team, uh, there are no granulomas. And if you look at the cytokine signaling in the skin, here you can see the signature cytokine of a Th1 gamma interferon. And in uh, leporomatous, you see IL-4. So finally, Here's the last uh, picture. Um, these are just three of the subsets. We haven't talked about T follicular helper cells. We haven't talked about Th22 cells. We haven't talked about Th9 cells. These are the ones that are most prominent that you should recognize. You should know that Th1 is important for intracellular pathogens, where Th17 is important for fungi and um, neutrophil-mediated defenses, while Th2 are involved in uh, allergic and elminthic. Each of them have signature cytokines, Th1, uh, gamma interferon, uh, Th2, IL-4, and Th17, IL-17. Um, each of these come up, uh, develop because they've got the message from the, from, from the battlefield. Came back to them on a silver platter. It says, I know 
that there's a dangerous um, um, uh, threat to us out there. I know what it is. I know how you can kill it, and I'll tell you where to find it. Following that, if things go well, we do good, and we re return to ho immunologic homeostasis. But when things don't go well, we either die from immunodeficiency, or if it goes too well, it leads to autoimmunity, and we need mechanisms to control that. So. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. William Rigby up here to take us through um, those control mechanisms. So we'll, we'll chat more at lunch today. Thank you very much.